Hi, everybody, and welcome to the CosmoQuest Science Hour. It's Wednesday, November 7th, and I'm Emily Lakdawalla of the Planetary Society, here today with a special guest, Pan Con Conrad, from uh, the Curiosity Mars Science Laboratory mission. She's a deputy principal investigator on the Sample Analysis at Mars, or SAM instrument, which is one of the enormous analytical laboratory instruments that has made Curiosity so large, and is what's going to make it um, do some of the, the some of the breakthrough science that's that's making this mission quite different from a lot of previous missions. So I want to thank you, Penn, very much for joining me today. Oh, you're muted. Is your microphone muted? Oh, there we go. <laughs> How's that? That's much better. <laughs> good. I'm happy to be here and especially happy not to be muzzled. <laughs> very good. Well, and I guess you just exited a planning meeting in order to come join me, so I'm, I'm uh, very honored that you did that. Yes, we meet morning, noon, and night. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you're happy now to be switching to Earth time. You guys have been living on Mars, Mars time for three months now. Um, I don't know. Do, some people like Mars time a lot. How about you? Well, I'm not too crazy on shifting my sleep schedule around every couple of days because it's more than just living on Mars time. It's also living on the time when we can get the orbital assets at Mars to relay our data back and forth. So it's very exciting to think that now I can actually sleep at night and maybe at some point in the mission get a weekend off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no rest for the weary. And anyway, you've got you've got, how many years have you personally been working on getting this particular instrument to Mars? Well, I've been working since uh, 2005. We actually wrote the proposal in 2004, and then we jumped into the planning phase in 2005 once our instrument was selected. So it's been a long haul. So um, your instrument, sample analysis at Mars. I've been reading the. Um, the peer-reviewed paper on, on what this thing exactly is supposed to do, and it's really astonishing. It's amazing how many actually science instruments it is crammed into one very small box inside a very large rover. So I, I guess you have the, there's, there's a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which I have heard of on planetary missions before. There is a tunable laser spectrometer, which, correct me if I'm wrong, has not been sent to the surface of a planet before. Is that right? That's correct. And then there is the quadrupole mass spectrometer, which is also an unfamiliar term to me. So this is, this is complicated. This is a lot of things at once. Yeah, it's, it's actually even more than the three instruments that are part of the suite. We also have some supporting subsystems that are unusual and very sophisticated. A whole sample manipulation system that can take our little cups over to an inlet funnel to receive uh, portions of either Martian soil or drilled rock. And we have a complete gas processing system, which is basically a plumbing series of manifolds and pumps and things like that. And we have a very small set of cups that contain a chemical processing laboratory so that for those types of recalcitrant organic molecules that can't be pyrolyzed, we could potentially chemically derivatize them and then make them detectable by the nominal means. So you're talking about pyrolyzing samples, and I'm, I'm, I understand that basically SAM is a gas instrument. It's an instrument that's designed to determine the, the comp, both the chemical um, composition, the elemental composition, the isotopic composition of gases. So it's straightforward to do that for an atmospheric sample, <laughs> but you have to turn these solid samples into gases somehow. So how do you do that? That's exactly right. We can't look at anything that isn't a gas. So the, the short explanation is we take a cup of solid sample and we seal it up against a high temperature oven and we then proceed to heat to about a thousand degrees centigrade and then whatever we can volatilize from our sample up in that temperature range will come off and can be sampled by our mass spectrometer or if we think there's a lot of organic chemicals in the sample once we've seen it, we can route some of the gas through the gas chromatograph and separate out the different species by their retention time on a column and then send it to the quadrupole mass spectrometer so that we can get a look at what we've got. So to, to back up quite a bit, let us um, let me ask you exactly um, what, what are the main questions that you're trying to answer with this instrument um, on this rover in this particular spot on Mars? <laughs> well, if you go back to the very biggest question, 
it's not even a single measurable yes or no answer and that is has Mars ever been habitable or is it habitable now and the way we measure habitability at present is not something for which there is general agreement in the community there are various parameters that have been suggested and we can sort of bin that into two categories of measurements what is stuff made out of and what does stuff do and then when we look at those attributes about an environment we can try to make an assessment about whether or not we think it's potentially habitable with respect to the Mars materials we can actually look at what stuff is what it's made out of and then make some inferences about what it's doing by making measurements over time so that we can get an idea of the dynamics and the processes that might be happening on the Martian surface or in the Martian atmosphere. So, in the, so let me just finish your, yeah. and answer your question more directly. To address that very big objective, we measure chemistry. And so our objectives are to look at the reactive chemistry, especially to survey for potential hydrocarbon compounds, which we know are made by life and can be used by life as well as by abiological processes and to understand the processes in the Martian atmosphere and look at the interface between solid materials and atmosphere and look at the overall planetary processes that may or may not have led to the evolution of a habitable environment. It's, it, it's all an incredibly complicated um, ex experiment in part because you have what's going on on Mars right now in terms of the atmosphere, the atmosphere changing with time quite rapidly on a seasonal scale. You have the atmosphere communicating with the soil chemically. The, the Mars' surface breathes, it's constantly interacting with what's going on in the air. And then the question about habitability is really addressed at Mars' very ancient past. So you're, you're also trying to get at all these, these, these things for, for Mars' Um, ancient rocks and these three billion year old materials that you're trying to get into your instruments. So how do you? How are you going to manage to disentangle <laughs> what's going on? I mean, I was reading. I was reading your paper and realizing that there's an awful lot of um, equivocal results in what's been on with, with like, especially with, for instance, with the Phoenix results, where it could be explained by this or it could be explained by that, and this is one hypothesis and that's another hypothesis. Ro the rocks are so much more straightforward. You measure a rock, you've got a, a chemical composition. The atmosphere, it doesn't, it's not clear to me how you figure out what's going on. <laughs> well, that's a very good observation. And one thing that keeps us awake at night is what can we possibly do that we haven't thought of before to make the most robust results possible so that even if we have big discussion in the scientific com community about the interpretation, at least we will understand very well our regional error and our specific error every time we make a measurement. So it's a good point, and it ties very well into your first question, which was what it's like living on Martian time, because as we start thinking about Martian time now and Martian time perhaps three billion years ago and what might remain from the original materials before the Gale impactor event that could be as old as the planet itself, trying to recognize the different windows of time and the stuff we're analyzing gets really complicated fast. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, it, so I'm sorry, I'm reading a list of questions that I have here. So organic material is one of the is one of the big goals that you have. Is your uh, your, your instrument is is clearly designed to study to pick apart organic material. How confident are you that you're actually going to find organic material in the samples that you pick up? Ah, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, we know from various models that we have seen about meteorite delivery to the Martian surface that whether or not Mars has ever made any hydrocarbon compounds, they certainly have arrived there delivered by meteor infall on the surface. And we also know that there are processes that alter the Martian rock that operate similarly to the processes that alter earth rock and we know that because we've seen samples of Mars in the SNCC meteorites so when we think about um, the probability that there are organic processes or organic materials or even let's just say reduced materials not necessarily hydrocarbon compounds in the strict sense I think there's a good probability that they're there the question is are they close to the surface so that we can access them? My hunch is there are some there and that we're going to see them. 
Excellent. I'm I'm very happy to hear that, and I and I wish you the best of luck in finding them because it will certainly be very exciting um, when you do. Right. Um, so one of the things I know that you're looking for when you look at carbon in specific is is isotopic ratios, and and I guess that was um, you guys did have your first press briefing about first results uh, last week where you said that you did not. Um, had not yet detected methane, which is, I know, one of the things that the press has been bugging you the most about since you guys landed. Um, and that it, it, you know, if, if methane is is there at very, very small levels, I know it's going to be hard for you to measure the isotopic ratio of carbon in that. I'm wondering if you can get at that question in um, any of the other carbon bearing, like even carbon dioxide, and, and will that help you um, understand anything about Mars's history? Sure. So, first of all, um, there's two kinds of, of measurement issues that, that we would want to look at. The first is how sensitively do we need to detect something to see it? And that applies to things that could be present in very low abundances. The second issue is how much uh, resolution do we have between masses so that we could see um, very, very precisely the isotopic ratios. So the answer to the first question is we have you know, single digit parts per billion for something like methane, which is a very small molecule. And so we also have very high mass resolution, which is why we have our tunable laser spectrometer, which is one laser of which is designed specifically to look for methane. We know for certain that we can get good carbon isotopic measurements because well, you know, because you listened to the press conference, we reported on our CO2 carbon mm -hmm. isotopic measurements last week. So we're very confident we can make those. Any other type of uh, trace carbon compounds that we find, uh, graphitic carbon or hydrocarbon or anything like that, how well we could resolve any types of isotopic ratios is dependent upon how much of the stuff is there. What's the abundance? And also, it's dependent upon the relative abundances of the two isotopes that you'd be measuring, which for carbon is good enough so that we feel good about that. If we find carbon dioxide evolving from solid samples, which, you know, if we see a carbonate, we're sure to do, or if we see any other type of solid phase carbon compound, uh, we'll absolutely capture that and detect it as carbon at a very sensitive level and we can send it into the tunable laser spectrometer and measure the isotopic ratio. So I think we're set to do that. What we'll find is anybody's guess. One of the things that was mentioned during the press briefing that I didn't understand is how, um, I think that it was mentioned that you could concentrate certain gases um, re by removing, I think, the carbon dioxide. Is that right? And can you explain how that works? Sure. So we can suck stuff into SAM, close a valve, uh, put it into a place in the manifold, suck some more stuff in there and try and increase the partial pressure of something. We have, just like you have in a submarine, carbon dioxide scrubbers and getters and a hydrocarbon noble gas trap. The way SAM is designed is that if you want to get stuff trapped somewhere cold, reactive stuff so that you can see tiny quantities of something else, you can trap it somewhere, suck in some more gas, trap more, and then keep trying to enrich like that. And so when uh, they talked about this in the press conference, what they were saying is, we've just done our opening salvo on the Martian atmosphere. We've, we've gone through a sequence of commissioning the, the instrument suite in a certain order. We haven't done uh, everything in our repertoire of tricks yet. So we will be commissioning the, the getters and scrubbers in SAM so that we can look at compounds that are separated out from big signals of other things that might mask small amounts of the thing we're interested in. So um, you've been, uh, you, you, the, rep the results that were reported last week were based on atmospheric analyses. You, as far as I know, you haven't gotten a solid sample into SAM yet, is that, is that correct? And, but you're That's just correct. about to, is that right? We hope it will be very soon. <laughs> I'm ready to eat some dirt. I, I saw some tweets yesterday saying that you'd gone through a dry run. So can you tell me about what the dry one was designed to, to do and and whether uh, you're prepared now? <laughs> well, uh, Sam is well prepared to look for solid sample. 
I, I didn't see the tweet, so I don't know exactly what they said. And as you know, I'm constrained by the rules of the road from talking about things we're about to do or have yet to do. So right. I can't I can't comment on that yet. Uh, all I can say is we haven't done any samples yet, but we're well prepared to do so. I looking at the block diagram for how your instrument works. The the number of valves and tubes and the basically the no, the number of knobs that you can turn on this instrument is insane. And so I'm kind of wondering how how do you visualize what the possibilities are? How do you determine which steps are the the right ones to use with a given sample? And how are you ever going to get it all commissioned for the first time, much less actually use it on this mission? Uh, well, so as you know, we've done a, a few atmospheric experiments by now, and you're right, we, we have an insane number of knobs, literally knobs, to tweak. We have more than 50 microvalves in two different pumps and all other kinds of uh, things, uh, dual ovens, and we have dual helium tanks, and a little oxygen tank, and so you name it, we got it in there. So the way we do this is we design a script. Uh, we write up an experiment the same way you'd write up a method that you would use on a benchtop instrument, only we have control over every single part of this one. There's nothing that's just set in stone from the manufacturer, if you will. And then we all go through and we review these scripts. And we, we poke at them and we try to see, could this cause an error? Could this cause this or that? Then once we have a really good script, we simulate it. We have a good series of software simulators. And then after we get a successful simulation, we take the script and we run it on our high fidelity test bed SAM, which lives at Goddard Space Flight Center in a, a Mars uh, simulation chamber. And we try to run the experiment under Mars condition using the script that we've just completed. We report on the results, including all the resources that are used, how much energy does it take, how long does the experiment take, and how much data volume does it generate. And then once we know all that stuff, we've basically gone through what systems engineers call the, the verification and validation process, which tells us that we've minimized as much risk as we can without actually doing an experiment, and then we let fly. Yeah, yeah I was reading, I, it seems almost like you've, you're it's not just a test bed. You're basically running an entire experimental <laughs> duplicate of this instrument in a Mars environment on Earth. It's, it seems to be a much higher fidelity than the usual kind of engineering test bed that I'm, I'm used to hearing about. Yeah, and that's because this is such a complicated suite. If we didn't build something that was very, very close to the flight instrument, we would never understand whether it was differences uh, in performance on the one on Earth from the one on Mars if we didn't get behavior that we had predicted on Earth. And that being said, something on Earth is still on Earth. It's not on Mars. So it's really, really close, but we, we are always saying, well, we're not on Mars, so how much more conservative should we be when we do our experiment on Mars? So it's a constant uh, refinement to make sure we're as good as we can be. Right, and I, th I think the archetypal example of an experiment that wasn't working on, on Mars the way that they hoped that it would was the experiments on Phoenix. I know they had such a difficult time on that mission getting their samples inside their instruments and then um, with the instruments behaving differently from, from what they had expected. I'm wondering if there are, were lessons learned from, from Phoenix that were applied to SAM. Um, what, what did you learn from, from Phoenix that helped you guys out? Absolutely. You're, you're thinking exactly the way we thought, and we went to meet with the Phoenix team in Arizona and just spend a whole day on lessons learned so that we could try to figure out what we should do differently to make sure we got sample in there. And, and that was fabulous. Uh, there was a lot of information about the Martian environment and also information about what it's like to do operations under a tight tactical timeline, uh, where the gotchas might fall, how many people you might need to do the different kinds of functions to make everything happen tactically in a day but still have people left over to analyze data after that. So we learned a lot particularly about the uh, chaos of the Martian wind and how ubiquitous it is. And so when we looked at that, we actually uh, had modifications made to Curiosity. I think you have a picture of our solid sample inlets that you might want to yes, throw I up. Do. I can do that one moment. So what I want to talk about, and, and we'll see this in a minute when you get the picture, is we actually designed little wind guards 
that are like a collar around the door that opens up covering our solid sample inlet tubes. And what those are meant to do is be a little wind break. And, you know, these guys at JPL are really awesome. They, they had a guy who went through and calculated speed of wind at different times of the day on the, the best meteorological models they could get and what direction it would be coming from and then showed what is a good direction um, to put the rover in when you're delivering sample to try to minimize that and then they just made sure that as robustly as possible sample would get delivered through the portioner and into our inlet tubes and we all had an opportunity during the testing before we got to Mars to go look at the the JPL rover test bed and watch a sample delivery happen and it was late at night or in the in the wee hours of the morning and that place was full of MSL people who were just cheering wildly when that little tiny sample dropped into <laughs> our inlet tube so we've seen it happen on earth we know what the challenges are on Mars, and now we will get to really do it when we get our first solid sample. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm bringing up an animation um, from Phoenix, which shows uh, this is their, at the top of the window here is their scoop. Inside the scoop is a bit of what's called the organic check material that they had drilled away and were trying to get inside a little gap into their instrument. And you can Actually, see the stuff just blowing away. Yeah, th so this is interesting that you bring that up. They're organic free blank. Organic free blank, yeah. Yeah, their material was a brick uh, of something um, which which has grains that are kind of lath-like. They're sort of flat and they loft really well. So uh, I actually am the designer of the MSL organic check material and I work closely with the people who designed the organic free blank on Phoenix, Doug Ming among them, who, who wrote the paper for Phoenix. And, you know, we were told, eh, you've got to look at these material properties and, and be careful. And so when we wrote our requirements for our MSL organic check material, what we did was look very carefully at the materials properties as we would be drilling because we don't scoop stuff necessarily the way Phoenix does. We're doing soil scooping as we get Curiosity ready, but as you know, Curiosity has a drill. So when we drill our bricks, our organic check material, we're actually going to drill it like the way we drill a rock. And so we will go through our portioner in our arm and we will put that thing very low, very close to our funnel and there won't be a ton of surface area across which the basically the wind could go flying. So we hope that by these lessons that we've learned from Phoenix, we'll be able to get a good sample when it's time to look at our OCM. And I think I have a picture here of uh, where your organic check material is. Um, it's, uh, it's in one of these, it's in these containers, is that correct? Yes, my babies. So, <laughs> so, so here, just to give context, this is the uh, self-portrait of curiosity that the Molly that's the hand lens imager on the end of the arm was used to capture 55 separate frames of the rover and they were stitched together into this absolutely amazing view showing the rover actually sitting on the surface of Mars and so here um, is those SAM inlet ports that we were looking at from a different perspective from the top of the mast earlier and here uh, go ahead and talk about your babies <laughs> so uh, so these babies are five little cans that are hermetically sealed that have an amorphous silica brick in there and they're doped with a cocktail of hydrocarbons, two organic uh, markers. The reason why we're not completely free of organics is because if we use these to try to verify the cleanliness of the drill, we want to know that we for sure got sample. So suppose we just had an amorphous brick and we saw nothing we would never know whether we didn't really get a sample or whether there was just nothing in it. So we put marker compounds in there that are not naturally occurring on Mars or Earth or anywhere else. And these compounds are detectable by SAM. So we put those in there in an ultra clean environment, sealed the the canisters after a very exotic process which you can read all about. There's a whole uh, SSR paper on that too. And then they were accommodated on the front of the rover and the way they're going to work is the drill will position itself over one of these five bricks when it's time to do a check 
and it will punch right through the foil lid and drill the brick. Deliver it to Sam the same way it delivers Martian rock and then we'll be able to compare what we know is in the can with what we see in a SAM analysis and if we see anything other than what is in the can we'll know that we've got some kind of a contamination. Are each of these cans a uh, single use or can they be used more than once? <laughs> Everybody asks that. Sadly uh, they're a single use so when we use them we'll be uh, scrutinized I'm sure by the entire science team since they're a, a limited consumable and there's, it's not the only limited consumable. I know that you have your, you have this carousel with um, a, quite a large number of quartz cups that can be reused, um, but then you have these wet chemistry cells that can't. So uh, talk about that. What, what's going to be good enough to, to get it into one of these wet chemistry <laughs> cells, and what are they for, really? Okay, so the wet chemistry cells are for conditions where we think that we might have hydrocarbon compounds that cannot be pyrolyzed. And yet, if they were to be derivatized, uh, carry with them uh, these um, the molecular digesters that are in these chemical laboratories, they would be something that could be made volatile so that we could look at them. And, you know, how to decide when it's time to break out the chemical processing lab, that's going to be a real science discussion. For example, whenever we want to advocate to do a specific science experiment with any part of the payload, all of the science people get together and, and make their case. And then if enough people agree, we officially request it to be in a tactical plan. So because we do everything by consensus, once we look at something that is a very limited lifetime item, will not only be consensus by the science team, but also, the project management and the principal investigators will weigh in on whether or not they approve the use of a, a limited material. So we'll be, we'll be very, very careful when we make decisions in the future about what we will or will not use. It, it's a very interesting social and scientific experiment to um, learn the negotiation of science commerce. It's really kind of fun. There's actually, there is a paper just published by a sociologist of uh, space missions named Janet Vertesi about the um, embodiment of the Mars Exploration Rovers by the Mars Exploration Rover team and how they all kind of identified with the rover physically as on, <laughs> she described it as a totem object basically, that everybody became uh, through the rover identified themselves. They called the rover, it wasn't even a she, the rover was we. It was the <laughs> embodiment of the entire team. It was a very interesting article and quite different from the usual article that I read. Um, I want to pause here for station identification just to tell people again that this is the weekly CosmoQuest Science Hangout and I'm Emily Lakdawalla of the Planetary Society blogging every day at planetary.org slash blog. With me today is Pan Conrad who is um, the Deputy Principal Investigator of the Sample Analysis at Mars or SAM instrument on the Curiosity mission. In about 10 minutes I'll be asking um, you guys for questions, any questions that you may have for Pan about what's going on on Mars and on this rover and what they hope to do. Um, but in the meantime I've got just a couple more questions I want to ask you. You know that the first time you send a new kind of experiment to another planet, there are certain questions that you can answer almost instantly as soon as you get on the ground. And then there are certain questions that will take a, a really long time to get to. So uh, can you tell me what are the what are the kinds of questions that you're hoping that you'll be able to report um, status on maybe by LPSC next year or something? What are the kinds of things that should be quick and, and relatively easy? And what kinds of things may take years to figure out? Or is there anything that's, that's, that's quick with this experiment? I would be really dumb if I said anything's going to be quick and easy. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> because every time I think something's going to be simple, it turns out to be fairly complicated. But I, I think the, the sort of more in-depth answer is, I, I think that, as you know, we, we already have a pretty good read on the volume mixing ratio of atmospheric constituents. I think we're going to have a, a, a pretty nice story about that. I think that we'll have a, our first solid sample and we'll be able to look at the volatile component of that. I think that there are so many things that, that uh, we have never really known but inferred about the Martian mineralogical component. That in itself uh, is huge and that's already been announced by Kemen. But we'll be seeing several more samples before LPSC. The question is, 
Well, we have enough stuff that we agree on to tell some of the bigger, more complicated stories about our landing site at, at Gale Crater. And, and these are complicated stories because we designed the mission to address the complicated stories. And it's going to be very tempting to have the hypothesis of the week about um, some set of measurements we've made where we try to make them very complicated. And, and we just won't be ready to do that. And we have to resist that temptation. I think that one thing that we'll know really well uh, is something about the weather because we'll have been operating for, uh, it, if not a quarter of the Martian year like Earth, an eighth of the Martian year, and we'll be able to look at what the weather is because we make measurements every day about the weather, something that you also already know. In addition, we'll be able to tell something about the diversity of the rocks in the places we visited uh, by looking at these many images which you see coming down raw every day. And I think that as we look at these images, we begin to tell stories about uh, what we think the stratigraphy is telling us. And as we look at those things, we don't get to make analytical measurements as often as we get to take images or do contact measurements, but we we will be able to get an in-depth look at a couple of things that help us form hypotheses about the things that we can only really see superficially. So I, I don't mean this to sound like weasel words, like we're not going to really know anything, but we might know something. It's just so difficult to predict based upon the level exchange that I see in the science discussions. There are as many hypotheses that explain observations of a picture of one rock <laughs> Uh, as you can possibly imagine. So it, it's it's going to be interesting. The, the saying goes that you put N scientists in a room and you'll have N plus one opinions about what's going on. <laughs> I, I think that's right, because not only do you have the constituents of the system, but there'll be an emergent property of the group as a whole, and I look forward to seeing what that will be. <laughs> and it's a, it's definitely a, it's a new group that hasn't had um, that much chance to, to work together, although I, now you've been working together for three months, but I guess now that you're going to Earth time, is the team um, dispersing? Is it all going to be more remote from now, or are you, are you still going to be co-located at JPL with with the engineers who are actually driving the rover around? Well, the original plan was to be at JPL for the first 90 days, and indeed uh, most of the teams have gone home to their institutions. And um, as we have been transitioning to Earth time, we've also been transitioning to distributed operations. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting having spent this time with everyone you see a voice or you just see a name uh, you know on a chat window or something and you picture the person and you've already got an image formed about how they tend to think oh yeah this is the lake guy oh yeah that's the <laughs> lava guy <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun it, it, it definitely is and I think that especially when people get sleepy they tend to get more entrenched in their uh, usual <laughs> opinions I've noticed <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I won't make you comment on that. I think I'll go ahead and ask for questions. I have a, a friend, my uh, my uh, coworker, Casey Dreyer, is not on the call, but he's helping me out. He's uh, looking across all of the comments um, on YouTube and on Google Plus, and also on Twitter, where people we've asked people to send in questions using the um, planetary live hashtag. So I'm I'm looking forward to having questions from Casey. And, and Casey, you can get those into me. Um, any time. Uh, let's see here. While I'm waiting for a couple more questions to come in. Uh, yeah, people are asking questions about things that are not curiosity. We're here, we're talking about curiosity right now. So I have another question that I'll, uh, while I'm waiting for other questions to come in, I'm wondering if you will be able to get um, uh, measurements of ancient isotopic ratios in the atmosphere by looking at rocks or if you're only able to get present atmospheric isotopic um, concentrations? So uh, that's a great question and of course it's something that we would love to do. And whether or not we can see something that's ancient is dependent upon two things. First of all, is it in the rock? Uh, you know, well preserved in the, in the rock? And the second, which is a much harder thing to determine, is uh, what has mixed in from later times with the ancient times and it's deconvolving that really ancient stuff from the bunch of time that has succeeded it that that will truly determine whether or not we can do that. I would love to do that and I certainly hope we do. Um, it, 
And actually, the very first question that I've got, it, it's just it's the question I wanted to ask to follow that up. You know, how long, uh, Jonathan Langdale asks, do you know the age of a layer that you might be sampling? And, and we know that we haven't done radioisotopic uh, uh, radio age dating on Mars. We don't have an instrument that can do that. But is there a good estimate for how long these rocks have been exposed at the surface the way they are now? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> And, 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 and how much I'm of a, a problem is that? <laughs> well, I'm a big advocate of geochronology, and, and I think we can develop methods over time. Um, certainly, you can do a couple of things in a relative sense, you know, the law of superposition. This thing's over that thing, that thing's over the other thing. But, um, you know, I consider it a problem because I'd love to know the history of that environment. So we'll see. Um. Uh, John uh, Reicher asked the question, is the reason, uh, could it be possible that Curiosity has not picked up any methane simply because of its location in the crater? Um, it, would you expect it to be inhomogeneous around the planet um, and maybe Curiosity just not in the right place? Well, that is an interesting question. So, first of all, there are two layers of controversy surrounding the observations that have been made from Earth through uh, telescopic spectroscopy and I think through Mars Express. You know, if, if you detect something on a global sense, uh, it's really hard to pick out what the, the mixing model is. And you do see from uh, the MUMA et al. paper um, maps showing um, potential distributions, places where the spectroscopy indicates you might have a concentration. So we, we think there are some regions that tend to show this from that reported work. We don't know the mechanism for methane generation. If methane is generated by geological processes, there are a couple of different candidate processes. If, if for example, you're an advocate of uh, hydrothermal alteration and processes that would release methane in that regard, we, we have an idea from Earth what those kinds of morphologies look like, and we could look for them. But the question of whether we're in the right or the wrong location it is probably uh, premature. First, we would want to see, do we detect uh, some kind of a variation seasonally in a detectable level, which would explain the sort of global detectable um, amount, which was you know, 10 to 20 parts per billion that have been reported already. If there's a sort of global distribution, then we should be able to see that during times when it would be present. But if it's a point source that happens in a few spots on Mars and then mixes all together, um, certainly it's a huge advantage to be close to it. But because we don't know the potential genesis, it would be hard to say we're in the right or the wrong spot. We are near the equator. Um, let's see, another question from John Ryer asks, was there, <laughs> I already, I know I know the answer to this one is going to be yes, but hopefully you can elaborate. Was there a test or scientific instrument that you wanted on Curiosity but had to be left behind due to weight considerations? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will confess that I was on five instrument proposals for Mars Science <laughs> Laboratory, uh, one of which I was the PI of, and of course I want that one to have been included. But uh, all kidding aside, you know, um, we have an amazing array of instruments on, on MSL, and I'm pretty happy with what we got. Is there, a, for let, let's say there's a hypothetical future land admission, is, you know, what would be the next step? Curiosity is very early days, but what would be the next thing that you would really like to see um, get down to the surface of Mars? Oh, wow, well, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, Oh, I already told you I'm a proponent of, of geochronology. I don't think we're quite there yet, so I think that's a ways off. Uh, for the next mission to Mars, um, I kind of like the idea of the precedent that was set by both Viking and the Mars Exploration Rovers of, of beginning your little network of friends across the planet. And as you begin to study processes that happen at, at the surface level on Mars, to be able to correlate that with what's happening somewhere else in that interface between the surface and the atmosphere would be amazing. So if you had something that was kind of like Sam, but in another place on Mars, say not so equatorial, and you could begin looking at atmospheric exchange with the surface, that would be 
just unbelievable. I guess the, the two kinds of larger missions that have been proposed most frequently for Mars and always seem to be 20 years into the future are Mars sample return and then a Mars network of some kind of a, a weather and seismic network. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know which one I'd rather, I, actually I kind of want to see the, the, the Mars regional network myself because that will help you understand Mars as an active planet, uh, which it is. As, and it's a uh, it's dynamic and changing all the time. As you talk about, you're going to be seeing the, the weather changing over time at your site. Sure, it's kind of like trying to plan for your retirement. You have a diversified portfolio of stuff so that your whole financial picture can be painted. <laughs> and, and to understand something like habitability or planetary evolution, we need a bunch of different types of missions. And, and frankly, I'm just not experienced enough to be able to have a good sense of what should come next I can only see the really big picture and say, these are all the toys that I'd like to have. <laughs> and that hope that somebody will put them down there in some order before I die. And there is there's an art to selecting the right suite of toys to send. You don't want to wind up like Phobos Grunt and have 17 different instruments and then not manage to get to Mars. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sorry. We had an instrument on Phobos Grunt as well, so it's uh, it's it's not, it's not it's us too. Um, Let's see, Andrew Planet says, would it be possible to backtrack and use SAM on areas the rover passed by at the beginning of the mission? I'm not sure what in specific he's asking about. Maybe that, that site where we saw the, the um, running the, the conglomerate rock, and would you even want to use SAM on a conglomerate? Well, so SAM, the use of SAM for a solid sample is completely dependent upon what the, um, the the sample acquisition and processing hardware can or can't do. And so they make, so first of all, there's scientific advocacy. If all of the scientists say, we really want to look at this X, uh, this rock over here, and here's the scientific justification, then we could make a case for it. And then the engineers would tell us whether or not it was basically safe or, or minimal risk to do it. So if somebody advocated for a specific rock that we'd already been by, I'm sure we'd come up to a science discussion and we'd all debate. But the main thing is um, whether or not we would go back in the exact same direction or go in another direction would all be um, items for discussion. And so it, it's, it's a community and there's discussion about everything. Um, there's a, another question that's come in from Trevor Soar. Um, and before I, after I ask his question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something to it myself. He says, is there any kind of smoking gun evidence that you might find that would make you say there definitely was life on Mars? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh. and I want to add to that because, you know, I've, I've, I know a lot of people on the mission. John Grotzinger and I have talked a lot. And he was very careful to tell me early on, his, he said, you know, we've got to be careful about the message from this mission. This mission is looking for habitable environments. It's not designed to, to look for life or to find life. And I've been doing my best to help communicate that to the public. And yet there's all my fellow space journalists out there want just they, they want their they dream that curiosity is going to stumble across something and we'll be able to say there was life on Mars. So so how do you answer that that kind of hope and question that you get from members of the public? <laughs> you know, so I'm an astrobiologist, so I, I love this whole topic, life on Mars. And the mission we have is how can we measure the habitability potential of Mars? And that is really tricky, but somewhat easier to approach than being able to say, oh, here's how you look for life and here's how we'd recognize it. The, the, the short answer to that latter question is, I have no clue how we'd recognize life if it's not life that I can pattern after the life that we have on Earth. But what I can tell you about the planet is that we see minerals on Mars like the kinds of minerals we make on Earth that are thermodynamically and kinetically predictable. And we understand the principles by which these solid things form and how they make rocks and how planets differentiate from the inside out. And we understand atmospheres and, and how they happen. And we know something about the physics of the ionizing radiation from background galactic cosmic rays, solar cosmic rays, etc. So we can look at stuff on Mars and we can back out of what we see, processes that have affected that stuff. And in doing that, we're looking at something a little bit more universal than something like life, which we've never seen anywhere other than Earth. So to me, as a habitability scientist, that's a, that's a tractable problem that we can approach. But I'm just scratching my head all the time about 
how to say that I would have definitive, definitive evidence of life on Mars um, truly unless there was something that, you know, was so Earth-like it was bulletproof. Unless it walked across the surface and knocked on the rover. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question from John Ryer is that the Viking landers had ambiguous signs of odd chemistry. Um, how do you deal, he says, have you taken in, in account for possible weird, weird soil chemistry? I guess my question related to that is how do you deal with the unknown unknowns that you'll be encountering <laughs> in, uh, in the chemistry as you go throughout this mission and all the different kinds of soils and rocks that you're going to be encountering? Well, that's a great question because how to plan for unknown bad things happening and how to plan for unknown fortuitous science uh, is, is really tricky because we are so conditioned by the patterns that we know how to recognize. Um, if, we, if we don't see an expected pattern, we might miss an unexpected pattern. So, for example, looking at how things partition with respect to Earth and expecting them to behave the same way on Mars is probably not a good idea because there may be elements of the Martian dynamic that we don't understand yet. So from my perspective, the only way, at least as an individual, that I can prepare for things like unexpected soil chemistry, as we measure the soil chemistry, uh, keep spinning the air around in my head and making sure that I am completely stripped away of previous bias based on my Earth experience. And, you know, I live on Earth as much as I've lived on Mars time in the last three months. It's just really tough because I've spent a lot of time in the field and, Every time I see an image come down from Mars, I go, oh, yeah, I saw something like that over in X field site. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's tough. Um, let me, uh, before I ask you my next question, let me issue a last call for questions. We've got a few minutes left. Maybe I have time for, for one or two more questions, so get them in right now. Um, but, yeah, I forgot to ask you about field sites. One of the things that has really impressed me about the team on this mission is that it is so much more packed full of people who have actual real Earth field experience than uh, previous landed Mars missions have been. And I'm wondering um, if, you know, which field site in particular seems most reminiscent of, of Gale Crater, or are there, is it a mix of several? <laughs> well, uh, so first of all, I haven't been anywhere on Earth that looked exactly like Gale Crater. I did a quick search of analog sites um, during the time that we were having these public landing site workshops and I was actually interested in Gale for a while and so I started looking at Upheaval Dome in um, Utah, it's a national park. Uh, but you know, just because you have a big crater, a big crater on Mars is not like a big crater on Earth because we just have such a, a ubiquitous and pervasive biosphere. So the chemistry that you see as you move through eons in the rock layers of Gale is going to be processed differently unless you have had this level of perturbation by living things. So, man, I, I don't know how to answer that question because uh, as a purist, I don't see anything as analogous as I would want it to be on Earth. What you can do is pick out little pieces of analogy that hang together well from places on Earth that might match some criterion on Mars. Some places are too wet on Earth, but they're cold enough. Some places are too alkaline on Earth, but they have the right morphology. So you just have to keep that in mind and constantly be scrubbing the analogy so that we know which factors are really analogous and which ones aren't. It's a, you mentioned that you're an astrobiologist. I'm guessing that you did not major in astrobiology in college, so I'm wondering <laughs> how, how did you get to become an astrobiologist? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's pure uh, silliness and, and luck and fate. Uh, I majored in music in, in college, and then I awesome. went back to graduate school and did more music. So I, later in my life, I just... Uh, decided, I, I was a, a television producer for a long time, and I, I looked at the science that I was making film and video about and said, you know, I'd rather do this than make a, a movie about it. So I became an astrobiologist because when I was finishing my pretty hard rock mineral physics graduate education, um, I thought there had to be strong relationships between the living things on Earth and the abiological component. You, you are not only what you eat, you are evolved of your place. 
And so at that moment, as I was thinking those thoughts, astrobiology began to emerge as a discipline. And so got in on the ground floor just by luck. It's you know it's luck is so often a, co a component of people's stories about how they got anywhere in planetary science and also I'm I'm really happy recently to discover more and more people who seem to have gotten into science late who had different careers to begin with and then uh, wandered into it because they loved it and so I'm always happy to to find more people for for whom that that's a part of your story and I might add that you know uh, you don't have to be especially smart I, I've met a ton of people on this mission <laughs> who are way smarter than I am but what you have to be is curious enough to just show up every day and if you keep showing up you might accidentally end up at Gail Crater <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I could take more questions, but I think that is a terrific place to stop. So I think that that we'll we'll close with it there. Um, I want to thank you so much, Pan Conrad, sure. for taking the time to talk with us about what it's like to work on this most advanced and awesome rover that's ever been sent to the surface of of another planet. Um, I'm Emily Lakdawalla with the Planetary Society. You can find me at planetary.org/blog. This is a CosmoQuest Hangout. Um, you'll find a lot of other people um, on the next CosmoQuest Hangout. It should be tomorrow morning at, at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, featuring lots of your favorite space bloggers. Um, and I think, I forget exactly what's on next, but there, uh, Fraser Kane, I think, has another podcast, another uh, Hangout, just in another hour. Also, um, this is, is, uh, is not officially endorsed by Pan Conrad or anybody at JPL, but I personally, representing the Planetary Society, would like to point out that we do have, uh, we have had an election. There is a president who's going to be president again for the next four years, who is presiding over a budget that is not very good for planetary exploration. So I would like to encourage everyone watching this to go to planetary.org slash SOS and write a letter to our president to say we want more money for planetary exploration so we can do more amazing things like the Curiosity mission. So thank you very much and, uh, and I hope to talk with you again. This has been great fun. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>